morning, Napa Valley Life Church. Thanks so much for joining us for another online service. If you would like to give or tithe to the church, there are three ways to do so. You can give online. Just go to nvlife.org slash give. Uh, you can mail in your offering, and you can find our address on the website as well. Or you can drop it off during the week. On Mondays, we'll be having our free food market here at the church from 11 to noon. If you would like to be a part of that as far as volunteering or picking up food, just come on down. We'd love to see you there. Napa Valley Life Church, we are so glad that you're with us again today. And we're really excited. Um, during this COVID time that's been difficult for everybody here, it's also been difficult for people abroad and our missionaries particularly. The people that we support that are overseas, some are in states, but many of them are overseas that are spreading the gospel. Uh, they're helping feed people. They're doing incredible work over there. And we're also going to talk about a campaign that we're starting over the next three weeks to help support a couple of our missionaries. So Jerry, tell us what we're thinking right now. We have a new campaign that we're bringing to you over the next three weeks. And so Jerry, will you introduce that a little bit? We hear from our missionaries on a uh, quarterly basis and sometimes a monthly for their needs. And there's two compelling missionaries this month that we would really like to help support with additional funds over and above our normal amount. And uh, we have uh, Brent Longnecker in the uh, Philippines and James Cindy in Greece. And both are helping support through feeding programs with the uh, members of the church and the local community. And they just are short of funds to provide the food that's needed out there in the, in the community. Yeah, it's, you know, one of the things as the church and as the missions, we've been doing it through our, feed, our free food program on Monday mornings. Uh, we start realizing that uh, during pandemic, during times like this, the needs change. And so you have to adapt to serve your community. And so these missionaries are. And I know these two guys, these two families have done a major adaptation to what they were doing before to start really feeding their community, start really meeting those tangible needs along with the spiritual needs of spreading the gospel. It's incredible. Um, so Jerry, tell us what the goal is of this of this uh, fundraiser that we're doing. What we'd like to do is raise $1,000 per missionary to uh, contribute to their feeding program. And we're gonna do that over the next, uh, say, three weeks. So what we wanna do is $1,000 per missionary. So there's two missionaries. So our goal in this fundraiser is to raise $2,000 so that these two missionaries can start serving their community more effectively. So the way that you can participate, the easiest way is if you go to nvlife.org slash give to make sure that in the comment section you say special missions offering or something to that effect. We'll get it. We'll understand if we see that. And that money will go directly to the missionaries. We do not, the church does not take any of that money. Jerry doesn't take any of that money. It's going directly to these two missionaries. Now over the next three weeks, we plan on getting the $2,000 in. I think we could do it, church. We know we can do it. We're really looking forward to it. And I think it's gonna make a big difference in the uh, ministry of these two men over there. All right, so keep an eye out for those videos. Give online so that you can help support them. If you cannot give online, go to our website. You can see our address. You can either drop it off or mail it also to us. Again, just put mission, special missions offering on that so that we know where it's going. Thank you, Jerry. But don't forget, not just your money, we need your prayers. Oh, there we go. Yes, we need your prayers, absolutely. Jerry, bringing in the big guns there. Got that? <laughs> All right, let's get into a time of worshiping our Lord this morning. Sound of dry bones rattling. 
This is the place, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire is stirring something new. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. The resurrection power runs in my face too. I believe there's another miracle here in this room. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of dry bones rattling To save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah if there's anything that he can do. Just ask the stone that was rolled up the tomb.
kids, welcome back to our series, Faith Alone. This week, we're going to talk about another Old Testament guy. I think you've heard of this guy, Noah, you know, the one that built the ark. You can hear his story in Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to give you the short version. You see, God saw that everything in the world was no longer good. So he decided he was going to flood the entire world. Now, he did find favor in one person, and that was Noah. So he told Noah to build an ark. Now Noah was thinking, an ark? I don't even know what an ark is, let alone how to build one. But God told him, well, not in these exact words, but he told him it was a really, really, really big boat and that he would give him every detailed instruction on how to get the job done. All he had to do was follow the directions. And then once the boat was built, he wanted him to gather two of every kind of animal, male and female. And then he asked him to get all the food he could for his family to make sure that they would be safe from the flood. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22 tells us that Noah did everything exactly as God told him. Then the flood came and all who were on the boat were protected. God was so gracious in keeping his promise. So now, you see, Noah was another one of those famous guys. Not because he built a ginormous boat, but because of his faith in God, it led him to obedience. He did exactly what God asked him to do. So see kids like Noah, our faith can help us do what God commands. Because of our faith, we can do those really, really difficult things like love your neighbor and your enemy and serve others around you that need help. So kids, this week I would like you to talk with your family and see what God might be inviting you guys to do that would require faith and obedience. And remember our memory verse, Hebrews 11:6. without faith it is impossible to please God. Well, there you have the story of Noah. I hope you guys have a really great week and I'll see you soon, bye. Good morning, Napa Valley Life Church. We are so glad that you joined us this morning for our next installment of Faith Alone series. And we wish we could be together, but again, we're just glad to be able to do this with you guys today. We're in our series called Faith Alone, and we're in our fourth week of it. In the last couple of weeks, we've been unpacking faith stories, but this week we're going to look at one a little bit different. We're going to look at the story of Noah. And what's important about the story of Noah is that you're going to hear a word repeated over and over, and that's the fear of God, and we're going to unpack what that looks like. And again, so let's read that from our text, and it's in Hebrews 7. It says this, By faith Noah, after he was warned about was what was not yet seen and motivated by a godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Let's open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to unpack this. Oh, Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for these stories and, and these reminders in the book of Hebrews that points us to faith and the idea of faith in you and faith in the unseen and trust and hope for what is to come. So, Lord, as we unpack this today, we pray that you open up our hearts and minds that we hear from you and that your message becomes clear to us. We thank you and we praise you, and it's in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. So let's recap a little bit again. Hebrews is a book written by an unknown author written to Christian Jews, and it's calling them back into a relationship with Christ. It's calling them back into the reminder of who Christ is as a person, what Christ means, the whole idea of his death and his resurrection and the idea of his sacrifice for us. And they were using very specific stories of people who were around way before Christ who by faith were able to be seen as righteous in God's eyes. And again, today we're unpacking Noah's story and talking about his step into faith. But week one, Tony unpacked the beginning verse, which I think is crucial to go back to, because if you remember, we we spend each week talking about the five solas. And this is important for us to continue to remind ourselves of. And those five are that it is by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, 
through the scriptures alone and for the glory of God alone. And why is that important? Because this is the story of Christ. This is the story of salvation and redemption. And our portion of it comes really into play with faith. Because if you look at the rest of it, grace alone, that's not for, by us. Christ alone, obviously that was Christ. Scripture, that was written and inspired by God. And then through the, for the glory of God. So those are important for us to remember. So that was week one. Tony talked about the idea of faith, and faith is believing in what is not seen and hoping for what is to come, which is very important. Week two, we looked at Cain and Abel. And what was interesting about Cain and Abel's story was the idea of being under judgment. And under judgment is something that it should weigh heavy on us. It shouldn't keep us from moving forward and and really seeking God out. But we have to remind ourselves that we are under judgment. And what that does is it places God in his right place and us in ours, with God having a higher place and us having a lower place. Week three, Tony looked at, actually last week, Tony looked at the story of Enoch. And what we love about the story of Enoch is that he had a short life, but one that was pleasing to God. And God took him away before he died and before there was any suffering. And what we came from that from last week was two things that we must confess and believe that reward will come. And this is truly important because if we confess the gospel of Jesus and that Jesus alone will save us, then what is to come is eternal life. Second part of that is we must see the effects of faith, that Enoch's faith freed him to walk with God, a natural, yearning, attractive walk. And what I like what Tony said last week is that this walk with God should draw you in. We're under judgment. We remember that. We're saved by grace through Christ. And we should be drawn into a relationship where we seek and yearn to know more about God. And this week we're looking at Noah. And again, Noah was justified by faith because he had a healthy fear of God. What he feared was the wrath of God. And as we unpack and read through that story, we'll get to hear some key passages within this that will kind of make it more real for us why he was afraid of God and why he had this healthy fear of God. Because if you think about it, he was asked to build an ark. He was asked to build this enormous boat for what he assumed would be a a massive water event, but really didn't quite know the full outcome of it. I mean, none of us called into that huge of a task would really be able to wrap our heads around it. So he had to have a very healthy fear of God and God's ability to punish, for lack of a better term, to destroy his own creation because of his displeasure with it, because of it turned away from him. So God asked him to take on a task. He took on that task. And there's a lot within the story of Noah that we're not going to really look at. We're going to focus on his healthy fear. Now, I don't know about you. Growing up as a kid, I had some of the most epic toys, okay? Rock and sock and robots. I mean, where else do you get to pound on a robot and that just sits there and beats up somebody right in front of it? Great one. Second one I liked was Mousetrap. I don't know if you ever had to construct that thing. Never, ever came out the way it looked on the box. Never. It just didn't, okay? But I still approached it like I could and and I believed I could build it. Playmobil. I don't know if you guys ever knew Playmobil. That was my childhood favorite because it created this world where I could build all different things and use my creativity. The one that scared me the most was the Etch-a-Sketch. I could never figure out how in the world you could, with two little knobs, draw the most perfect pictures. Not mine. Mine was a jagged line that disappeared and reappeared. So I had a fear of using the Etch-a-Sketch. I really did. I didn't want to use it. But there's something really neat within the Etch-a-Sketch that I learned later on in life is that with an Etch-a-Sketch, once you drew a picture and you got to a point where you didn't like it, you actually could just take it and shake it and shake it, shake it, and erase it, and it was gone. We're going to come back to why that's important, because if you think about this, I had a fear of drawing on the Etch-a-Sketch, because I knew I couldn't quite do it, but there was something neat in the aspect that with a shake, with a moment, it was gone, and it was a clean slate again, and I could start over. So we'll get to that back here in a minute, but let's go, if you have your Bibles, let's jump right into Scripture, and I want to start in Genesis, and we're going to unpack the beginning part of the story. In Genesis 6, 5 through 8, we're going to start right there, and I'm going to read this to you. It says this, Genesis 6, 5, 
When the Lord saw the human weakness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind who I created off the face of the earth together with animals, creatures that crawl, birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor in the Lord. Take a minute and just think about that statement. That statement puts fear in me. That statement would scare anybody, and it put this fear in Noah because Noah saw the destruction. Noah saw the evilness. Noah saw all the wickedness around him. And then God called him to build this ark because he despised what he had created. To me, that's a frightening statement in itself. If you go back to that, then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind who I created off the earth. God was willing to destroy all he had created. And that doesn't scare you a little bit at a time about how our mistakes have such a huge weight of judgment, we need to to really sit back and then ask ourselves some some questions of why it doesn't. Let's continue on. Jump down to verse 11. It says this, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on earth. Again, we see that there's just this level of horrific behavior and everything associated with that that was just detestable to God. Verse 13 says this, then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every wicked creature for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Put yourself in Noah's position just just for a minute. Just this idea, you're having this conversation with God and God is saying that he detests everything that he's created. Okay, Noah's got to be sitting there thinking, okay, God created me. He, 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 does he detest me? What, where do I fit within this picture? And God says to him, I've decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Even reading that passage puts this sense of fear inside of me, this, this idea that I have to sit back and look at my nature as a person. Yes, I'm created in the image of God. Yes, I am loved by God, but at the same time, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, because of the entering of sin, I'm seen as detestable. I'm seen as wicked, as evil, as something that God wants destroyed. Could you imagine being Noah at that moment, just with this fear? Let's go on to verse 17, it says this. Understand that I am bringing a flood, flood waters of the earth, to destroy every creature under heaven. Again, that reminder of complete and total destruction. With the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. All of a sudden, Noah gets this idea that God is going to spare him, that he sees God's displeasure with everything around him, but he's going to be spared. He and his family are going to be spared. So the sense of fear is still there, and Noah is willing to take on this enormous task, even though he is absolutely fearful, absolutely fearful, because everything's about to be destroyed. And what is the importance of that? Right off the bat is that faith is found in healthy fear. Let me repeat that. Faith is found in healthy fear, not a debilitating fear, not a fear that sets us aside and keeps us from moving, but faith is found in a healthy fear. If you go back to the passage that we were reading, and it talks about this, and I love this within this passage, it says, by faith, back in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, by faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen, again, warned about the destruction, he had not seen this destruction, but was told about it, and motivated by, and this is the key here, if you look in the text, it says, godly fear. And I looked at a couple of other versions within this. I looked at the ESV and I looked at the NLT. And all three of them note this portion of the passage, godly fear. Godly 
fear, healthy fear, a good fear of the Lord. And again, if we look at where we're at with this, faith is founded on a healthy fear. If you have your Bibles, jump ahead with me to Hebrews 10. Let's look at this part in Hebrews 10, verses 29. Hebrews 10, 29 says this. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God, who has regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know the one who has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. Those are powerful words. Those are extremely powerful words that should instill within us a godly fear. A godly fear that recognizes us under judgment, that recognizes God's ability to destroy and expect that his creation would be righteous in his eyes. And therefore, none of us is just or able. None of us can find righteousness in God's eyes. But one, through one, through Christ alone. I don't know about you, but that should bring this healthy fear of God back into the forefront of our life. This healthy fear of God that reminds me it is by faith, through grace, through Christ, that I'm saved. I have a fear of my judgment. I have a fear of sitting in front of God, facing him without Christ standing there saying, I've covered it. I've done this. I've covered this. But that healthy fear of God helps us each and every day. That healthy fear of God puts perspective where it should be. So again, faith is founded on healthy fear. So let's ask this question to ourselves. Do we reflect, reflect healthy fear in our lives or we just consider the world and our actions to be good enough or okay? Let me ask that question again. Do we have a healthy fear of God that puts us, or excuse me, that forces us to consider our own actions against the weight of judgment? Or do we simply say, today I was good enough. I'm good enough. It's okay. I've, I've, I've done enough. I'm, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I, I don't do the things that this person does. Or whatever it is that you have to justify or explain your rationale of, of not being fearful. And for me, I don't think that's okay. I think having a healthy fear of God is one that reminds us daily the weight of judgment, the impact of sin, the cost that should be paid, but that was already paid for us. We have to keep that in the forefront of our mind. The second part about this, so the first part, faith is founded on a healthy fear. The second, faith reflects our healthy fear. Go back to the story of, Mo of Noah. And if you look at the story of Noah, his action came from a healthy fear of God. A lot of times we'll spend so much talking about Noah being obedient and submitting to God. And yes, he was obedient and he submitted to God. But the reality of the statement within Noah's story is that his faith is reflected in his healthy fear of God. His healthy fear of being destroyed along with every other piece of God's creation. Every other piece of God's creation was destroyed. And they talk about the flood and they talk about the epic levels of the flood, water levels rising so high, raining for 40 days and 40 nights, land completely disappearing. Think of your highest mountain, your highest peak, gone. I'm sorry, but God and God alone can bring that level of destruction. And Noah had a healthy fear, and that fueled his response. So again, faith reflects our healthy fear. The truth that the weight of sin is complete and total destruction of life. Let me say that again. The weight of sin is complete and total destruction of life. Faith means accepting that position and a total reliance on our Savior. A total reliance on Jesus Christ. Because without Him, we would not find favor in God's eyes. Without Him, we would not be seen as acceptable. It is through Christ alone. If you have your Bibles, jump with me again to Revelation. In Revelation 15, 4 
3 and 4 says this. They sang the song of God's servant Moses, and they sang of the Lamb. It starts in here. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you because your righteous acts have been revealed. God revealed his ability to destroy his own beloved creation simply because of its wickedness, simply because of its lack of fear, its lack of understanding of judgments, its lack of recognition of him, and he destroyed it. But his righteous acts, his redeeming acts, are seen through his son Christ. His redeeming acts is seen through the blood of his son who paid the price so we can be seen as righteous. We can be seen as clean. Faith reflects our healthy fear. I think what's interesting within that statement, and we'll, we'll go to our next passage, is in 2 Corinthians, but when we have a knowledge and understanding that faith reflects our healthy fear, we naturally will respond to that. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to Corinthians. And it's 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 15. And it says this, and it's, it's a big verse and a lot of passages in here, but I want us to understand the entirety of this. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 15 says this. So we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. In fact, we are confident and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make our aim to be pleasing to him. For we must appear, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There's that, there's that weight of judgment again. There's that sitting before God explaining why we deserve his righteousness. Going on to verse 11. Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade people. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your consciousness. We are not committing ourselves to you again, but giving an, you an opportunity to be proud of us so that you have, may have a reply for those who take pride in outward appearance rather than in the heart. For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are in a right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died and them and was raised. The one who died for them and was raised. This healthy fear of God leads us into action where our response is based upon this idea and this knowledge that God has his rightful place up high. We are down low. Again, God's position is above ours. We recognize that without the death of Christ, without his blood, without his sacrifice, we would not be seen as holy, as clean, as worthy of being with God. And because of that, we no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died and was raised. Our actions speak from our faith. Our response speaks from our faith. Noah's response speaks from his faith. And that's why God found him righteous. If you go back to the passage and read it again from Hebrews. By faith, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by a godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Noah's actions in responding to God and building the ark and, and putting his family and following those instructions, in essence, condemned the world around him because his actions were out of fear and reverence for God. His actions pointed out everybody else's sin, pointed out everybody else's shortcomings. The reasoning that God was displeased with this creation was pointed out. And because of his faith, he became the heir of righteousness that comes with that. So I never really let the Etch-a-Sketch 
create so much fear within me. And I, it, nowadays you can go online and you can Google all kinds of wonderful people who are phenomenal at the Etch-A-Sketch, right? They can create things that I, in my right mind, never in this world could create. I keep encouraging my daughter one of these times. I'm like, babe, you've got to create something on an Etch-A-Sketch. I think you could do wonderfully. Well, let's go back to, again, what I like about the Etch-A-Sketch. I may create and do something on that Etch-A-Sketch. It may not be perfect. It may not look good. But at the end, when it's not what it's supposed to be, and it's imperfect, and it's not okay, I have that moment where I can just take and shake it and make it go away, and it's gone. Having a healthy fear of God, recognizing that we are under judgment, recognizing the weight of that judgment should be and is supposed to be for us total destruction and death. But because of Christ, we are made new. Because of Christ, we are seen as clean. Because of Christ, that moment where all that was put on that Etch-A-Sketch is just erased and gone, our sin, because of the blood of Christ, is erased and is taken from us. Now, that doesn't remove the fact that we must continuously each day recognize and have a healthy fear of God, recognize the weight of being under his judgment, and be willing to have our actions come from that faith, from that fear. Let's end with this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 says this. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer live, excuse me, no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling himself to the world, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, he has made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. We can no longer sit under the weight of judgment without a healthy fear of God and simply not have our lives reflect that faith. We can't. We cannot sit there and justify, explain, work away or, or say things are good enough or compare, whatever it is, we cannot do that. Each day in Christ, we are made new. And we are made new because of his sacrifice, because of that judgment upon us, because we have and must have a healthy fear of God. Noah got it. He understood it. And because of his fear, he found faith. And in that faith, found was found righteous by God. Father God, thank you. Thank you for these men who came before who found faith and were reconciled in your sight because of their faith. Father, thank you for their stories and their messages that remind us that we are under judgment and that we should fear and know that what we owe is total destruction of our lives. But yet you, loving us enough, sent your son to cover us for that sin, for those trespasses. So Father, help us to look earnestly into our own hearts, into our own minds, and our own lives, and be able to place that healthy fear, that knowledge of judgment, and the restorative power of your Son in our lives each and every day. Father, we thank you for this precious gift. together, strange as neighbors, our blood is one, children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come, don't let your heart be true. Fear, evil, fix 
His kingdom come. 